All right, let me put my magic hat on. Actually, it's a rain hat. You put water in here, and it's supposed to uh, fill up the crystals and keep your head cool, but all it did was make my eyeglasses wet. And what do you want for $12? In any case, what we're looking at here, what did Bruce Hurt say? No man who is born of God practices sin because his sin abides in him and he cannot sin. Here in the present tense, clearly, is continuous because he is born of God. Your friend who is continuously sinning is in a bit of trouble theologically. See? I'm not a believer. See? You cannot sin. Wow. Wow. You know any believers that cannot sin? So here we go. Let's go back to the point I was I left off at. The following. We get the, the following words from 1 John 3 9, which this guy just read, Bruce heard. Each one who has been born of God does not sin at all. Right? For his God's seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God can only refer to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You mean to tell me you're going to point to yourself? That you cannot sin? At all? Wow. So since 1 John 2, 28-3-8 has in view the stark contrast between the Son of God and His righteousness and sin and the devil and the battle between them as exemplified but by potential acts of sin and righteousness by the children of God born of God, wherein the nature from which come sinful actions and the newborn of child born of God nature, from which comes godly righteousness, have both 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 been in view in the child of God, children of God, born of God, in first John up to this point. So don't tell me I'm born again and I can't sin anymore. I still have a sin nature. You don't think I'm not gonna exercise that thing? Unless I'm perfect, but we got a sin nature. You're not perfect. And since the battle is between God and the devil, that's the idea. Who you follow? God or the devil? The devil who sinned from the beginning, you want to follow him? His works of originating sin, lawlessness, and rebellion in himself and all of humanity against God, contaminating the whole human race and the world, so that all of mankind are physically born with a sin nature which causes acts of sin. And the other thing, and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who in his humanity was holy and perfectly born of God, that's not you or I. And remains absolutely righteous, who came to destroy the works of the devil and to take away sin, to enable each individual to trust in his work to receive eternal life and thereafter to choose to abide abide in his righteousness. And since 1 John 3, 9, A and B stipulate each one who has been born of God does not sin for his, his God's seed remains in him, indicating absolute sinless perfection, which is unlike the whole person of the children of God, born of God, who can choose to sin or choose to do righteousness, and both sin and born of God natures in view in John's first epistle up to this point. So it's not us that's in view, it's the devil and God, or the Son of God in view. The Son of God, born of God. We're not the born of God person in view there, we can sin. God's seed remains in us, yes, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. But we also have a sin nature. Not the same thing, right? And since 1 John 3, 9b goes on to say that God's seed who birthed his, Christ's humanity, remains in him, who ensures and preserves the one born of God's absolute righteousness so that he does not sin, and like the children of God born of God, who can choose to sin and do righteousness, both sin and born of God natures in view, in John's first epistle up to this point. And since 1 John 3, 9c, Further stipulates that the one in view who has been born of God does not sin. And it says, cannot sin. Don't tell me, Bruce Hurt, that you say, I cannot sin. Which is unlike humanity after the fall. And which is unlike you, Bruce Hurt, at the fall. Unlike the children of God, born of God, who is in a state of dichotomy. One part which cannot sin, and the other part which sins all the time. Both parts of which are in view in the whole person of, of the child of God born of God, in the context leading up to 1 John 3, 9. Reference 1 John 3, 2 to 8. And we have Romans 7, 20 to 24, and Galatians 2, 20 as well. And since 1 John 3, 9 does not have in view the rest of mankind who will remain unsaved 
and cannot do any acts of godly righteousness and sins all the time, then it is the one wholly born of God who, in his entirety, who does not and cannot sin, Jesus Christ, who is in view in 1 John 3, 9. All who trust in him for salvation unto eternal life will be justified unto his righteousness and to eternal life, and through him the works of the devil have been destroyed, enabling the child of God, born of God, to choose to abide in God's absolute righteousness. The holy born of God, son of God, in view. We're born of God, not complete yet. So, point three. The Greek words, hamartian ou poioi, rendered does not sin, in 1 John 3, 9a, is a present tense, third person, singular verb, signifying the one who has been born of God does not sin with neither the appropriate progressive present <coughs> context nor the required qualifying words to indicate does not practice or does not continue in sin or does not habitually sin, as some contend. You know, if you sin twice, you're practicing sin. So don't tell me I don't practice sin. I only sin once a week. That's called the practice. So for an occasional or even a single additional sin, which still qualifies continuing to sin or habitually sinning or practicing sinning, furthermore, these insertions into the text still do not then permit the whole person of the child of God, born of God with both sin and born of God natures, to be in view in 1 John 3, 9. Why? Because he can and still does choose to do, practice, continue to habitually sin according to 1 John 1, 8 and 10 until Christ appears and the child of God, born of God, will be like him without sin. 1 John 3, 2. So, 1 John 3, 9. Each one who has been born of God does not sin, for his God's seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So the Greek words rendered does not sin in 1 John 3, 9a, rendered each one who has been born of God does not sin is a present tense, third person singular verb, signifying the one who has been born of God does not sin with neither the appropriate progressive present context nor the required qualifying words to indicate does not practice or does not continue in sin or does not habitually sin, etc., as some contend, like Bruce Hurt. Furthermore, to insist on renderings of 1 John 3a, such as does not continue to sin or does not habitually sin or does not practice sin, is to insist on that which does not permit an occasional sin or even a single additional sin. For an occasional, let me change the spelling here, an occasional or a single additional sin would still qualify as continue to sin or habitual sin or practicing sin. These people who try to run these machinations around all over the place, except what is normal language context and logic and the language that the Bible is translated in, they're nonsensical. I don't know how people go to their churches. Thus, the attempt to change the original Greek text to allow for an occasional sin or an additional sin by the born of child God, child of God, does not succeed. So don't be all arrogant about yourself. I don't continue to sin, unless it's Tuesday. In the final analysis, the text does not permit any sin at all, excluding the child of God, born of God, who does, who still does choose to sin, practice, continue to habitually sin according to 1 John 1, 8 and 10, leaving only the Son of God who qualifies. Hence, 1 John 3, 9a is best rendered what it says. Does not sin correctly, indicating no commission of sins at all. Notice that a brother, a child of God, born of God, is viewed in 1 John 5, 16 as sinning a sin not unto death, and also may be sinning a sin that may lead to premature physical death, <coughs> evidently an ongoing activity. But nevertheless, he is a brother, a child of God, born of God, as it says, secure in his possession of eternal life. 1 John 5, 9 through 13. Furthermore, the phrase in 1 John 3, 9 C, rendered, and he cannot sin, confirms the absolutely sinless perfection of the one born of God in view in 1 John 3, 8 to 9. He does not sin because he cannot sin. We can sin. Is anybody, Bruce, you want to admit that you cannot sin? You, you quoted that of yourself. Note that according to the context of 1 John relative to the subject of children of God, born of God, they cannot claim at any time 
in immortal lives that they cannot sin, nor to have no sin, nor to have not sin, 1 John 1, 8 and 10. But instead, they must use God's remedies, remedies for when they inevitably do sin, which include walking in the light of God's absolute righteousness. Study Jesus. Find out how righteous he is. Keep him in mind. Keep your eyes on Jesus. See where you level, measure up. And when you don't, acknowledge that lack of measuring up. And then confession. That's basically the same thing. You acknowledge where you're falling short. And when you acknowledge where you're falling short, you're confessing. And God is faithful and just to forgive us those sins we confess and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 7, 1 John 1, 9. Although individuals of flawed in humanity can and have trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation unto eternal life, and have become children of God, born of God, they nevertheless have retained their flawed human conditions until the time when Christ appears, 1 John 3, 2, for the resurrection unto perfect humanity as Christ was born into. Again, notice that a brother, a child of God, born of God, is viewed in 1 John 5, 16, as sinning a sin not unto early physical death, and also may be sinning a sin that may lead to premature physical death. Evidently, it is an ongoing activity. But nevertheless, he is a brother, a child of God, born of God, secure in his possession of eternal life. 1 John 5, 9-13. Thus, the interpretation that 1 John 3, 9 and 5, 18 have in view that a child of God, born of God, does not sin or does not practice, continue, habitually sin, as some contend, and try to read that, read that into the text, cannot be true. Otherwise, there are innumerable contradictions throughout Scripture. Why would Scripture be writing epistles, for example, that show you what to do when you do sin, or to avoid sin? That opens up the possibility that you can and do sin. Any point. If sinless perfection, on point four, on the part of the child of God, born of God, his entirety, both sin and both of God natures, and born of God natures, is in view in 1 John 3, 9 then there would not be a need for much of God's word, only passages which lead up to and include salvation. Thereafter, one's becoming a child of God, born of God, would be perfect without a need to exhort to abide in Christ. And you won't need all those epistles to correct your behavior. But such cannot be the case unless major portions of God's word are misleading and contradictory, as I said. Well, here it is, 1 John 3, 9, each one born of God has been born of God, does not sin, for his God's seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So if sinless perfection on the part of the child of God, born of God, is in view, in 1 John 3, 9, then there would not be a need for much of God's word, only passages which lead up to and include salvation. Thereafter, well, throw out your Bible, you don't need it. Thereafter, the born of God experience, the child of God, born of God, would be perfect, with no need for instructions, corrections, forgivenesses of temporal sins, and so on. So all of the passages exhorting believers to grow in the word and abide in the righteousness of the Lord would be of no value, even in error. It presumes, it presumes something in which it automatically happened at the point of faith alone and Christ alone for salvation. Although sinless perfection in the entire child of God is claimed by some, amazingly, to happen automatically at the spiritual birthing experience, all of the passages which admonish a child not to behave like the world, such as 1 John chapter 2, Romans chapter 6, would then be misleading one to think that a true believer could practice sin. So if children of God, born of God, do not and cannot sin, then all of those often ignored passages must be expunged from God's word, including most of the New Testament epistles that provide instructions to believers on how to conduct their lives. But such is not the case. Children of God, born of God, do sin and must rem remedy that situation by what God has provided for when they do sin by a confession of sin. 1 John 7 to 2, 2. 1 John 1, 7 to 2, 2. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, one God with another, with each of we believers walking in the light, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, just acknowledging your wrongdoing. If we should say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and forgive us, and righteous to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness.